Alright, now is it fucking showing up? I don't even see it registering the mic now. What the fuck? Is there audio at all? Mm, la 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 la. There's audio. You can hear it. Okay. Fuck it. I don't know. The the meters showing it on the fucking shit. So whatever. All right. Sweet. Fuck it. We'll just go with this. I thought you know. The, had to bring this back. Classic. I think I wore this in two videos. Super rare video. The one no what was it? No cannon. One of those ones when I like he was bought the first five. I borrowed the first five. Fuck it, do it. Live. Yeah, I totally just had a complete fucking Hannity meltdown, didn't I? The one of the the first five videos I did, I did with my buddies. Uh, cannon. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't a rebel. It was like the step up from the level because he does like. He does pro pho photography on his own. And those first five, it had like the old, the old fucking huge giant uh, memory card, the CM, what do they fucking call those things? But man, I think the thing, I, I don't even know, might have been four gigs. I, maybe it was 16, they were at 16 by then or eight. But yeah, I did it with that. It's so interesting how different, no, it wasn't smart media. It's the, the a smart card. It was the big, is a specific Canon memory card type that was like it looked like a fucking DS game. Um, but yeah, I borrowed it from him, and then I did like the first. I think up through the oh, fuck, I can't remember the one where I was I was the one where I was complaining about them um, totally s stringing up that um, yeah compact flash yeah that yeah. Because the I was the last one I did with his camera was the one where I was bitching about them uh, selling out that little intern kid and telling him to review like Nation of Millions, having never heard it and knowing fucking nothing about the '80s or yeah, that was bullshit. That I think that was the last one I did with his camera, and then I got the GX2, which I jailbroke or did Magic Lantern on. That thing was fucking great, but then my kids knocked it over when. Like the week after I did, I tried to do the Morrissey video, which I recorded that in my backyard, same as like the Swirlies one with Shauna. It was like right after that. Those were the last two of the original run. This is like 20, early 2013, I think, was the last ones for that run. And then A, I wore, I, I wore a complete, I, I didn't even think about like what I was wearing. I don't know why. It was so bad. I was wearing this awful button down and I looked so fat and I was go I still had issues with my um the thing I have, which is basically clear because there's now drugs that totally work for this shit. So I'm on them big time. And so I don't have like I mean, I'm overweight, but like I don't have like the huge bloated face that I had in some of those videos. Fucking I can't say I'm watching those. Cause I used to, all I used to be able to do is just take steroids when it would flare up really bad and I'd get like bad arthritis shit. But, um, I was wearing this terrible fucking button down. made me look so fat. And I, I mean, I was a weight anyway. I hadn't, my weight loss thing, all that shit happened after like 2016. Like when I quit Twitter, I was just like, it's such a bad scene. I was in such a bad place. But anyway, um, yeah. Then I had the GX2. I did them almost all of them with that. And then my kids knocked the stand over and, uh, and they smack. No, they weren't road rage. I have I have latent rage all the time. I'm always angry. It's my secret, Captain. Um, yeah, but I, they they didn't. They certainly didn't help. 
in my life, like generally to be on them so often, uh, they do cause it's fucking totally legit. Like even prednisone and stuff, they make you completely fucking crazy. Um, if you're on them for a long time, but then you can't be on them for like three months or something more than that because you, it like thins your skin or fucks up your immune system, your liver, stomach, or some bleeding. It's fucking lame. I do that shit all the time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I got the classic. This is the Apex hat from the Apex video. And then this was in, I think, two of the original videos. Do I have a favorite camera you've had? I'm not a camera guy. Like, you wouldn't want to get a recommendation from me. I'm a complete, like, I do the bare minimum of shit to, like, get it to look semi-presentable. Um, I did everything in iMovie, like fucking, I, I have no, I don't, I, I don't know shit about like real video editing or real camera production. I mean, my, like I was telling you, my buddy's rig, my buddy's rig is like fucking 18 grand or some shit. He's got like a fucking mega telephoto. All the videos I did myself that I use my dad's Minolta lenses from like 1982. Like this shit, this is the original carrying fucking flight case for this shit. But yeah, like this is an old. This is the one I use. Yeah, this is the old Minolta. No, this is the one that's fucked up. That's why it doesn't even have a cover on it. This is the one I didn't use. This is a big telephoto. But this is like all from '82 when he went through his. Like that was a big yuppie thing. You were supposed to have a nice camera. That was like a like late '70s, early '80s. This is the Lumix G, piece of shit autofocusing lens that came with the original GH2 GX2 I had. And then this was a Canon lens. This sucked. I have adapters for both of them. But yeah, these old lenses are so much fucking better. This thing fucking rules. It's heavy as shit. But yeah, uh, yeah, go get your grandfather's cameras and your grandfather's lenses. And you can buy these like tin, tin Chinese, um, you know, manufactured adapters. And um, hold on. You can get these like shell adapters and they screw right into the to the camera body and then you can use like static old lenses that have way better glass and give you i mean they give you super short depth of field so like you can see in some of mine it's especially the early ones like it's fucking totally out of focus um but now it's kind of like there's not really a point like even on the gx5 i got that's like a i think it's like a 2016 gx5 i got used for like 300 bucks or something the lens that came with that it's totally fine. Like you just make the iMovie project 24 frames per second and it looks like, you know, any, it's, it's just, it's not worth the headache is my point because it has autofocus. So why wouldn't you use it? I just hate that everybody shoots in 30 FPS and they put up these videos, you know, all the YouTube shit I watch on falling asleep is like 30 FPS. It fucking annoys me. I don't know. Cause I'm old. Uh, what did you spend your Trump bucks on? I wouldn't spend any money. I'm nervous about the fact that I just bought a new fucking beach toy car fucking the week before this shit went nuclear. We've lost $25 trillion out of the global economy. This is fucking real shit. Like <laughs> the, the economy, the world economy is not coming back for like two, three years. I don't mean to go fucking Scott Galloway and shit, but it's going to be a fucking while. Like, and the Nuchin's already floated 20% unemployment, completely fucking realistic. I mean, I'm glad they're being dire about this shit because, you know, like I have a totally edge modern skill set, right? So I'm fine, right? But like, what the fuck? What is anyone else going to do? It's, it's fucking crazy. Plus, this thing's going to come and go in waves. They're not going to have a vaccine. Even if they have a vaccine, how are you going to produce it in enough quantities that people would have like access to it right i mean you've already seen people bitching about how celebrities are the only ones getting fucking tested right um yeah no it's super fucking bad so yeah i mean i would definitely not be spending trump money on fucking anything but like planning how long you can make it last the goth video this is the same wine glass from the goth video it's the only wine glass i have of this kind i think this is the one I haven't, I haven't had it. I haven't been drinking wine at all. It's been a long time since I've had red wine. I went back into that a couple of months ago. It's like really watching Jay Hardy. <laughs> We're all old losers. I'm drinking some really fucking 
this this shit i love this um the guy at the the store you know we're buddies he recommended it. it's super fucking cheap and it's like nice i don't i if it gets too heavy like big thick cabs and stuff i can't deal with that um what did i do i pulled a bunch of records i think again you guys had homework you were supposed to fucking ask me shit more than likely gonna quit my grocery job as a preventative it, you know you just got i mean i don't want to be flip about that shit that's hardcore. I, I'm sorry. I mean, it's fucked. Not everybody's, even people my age, like, <laughs> like I'm not saying like, oh, poor freelance kids out of college and music journalists. Like, dude, there's people my age that work in finance who've been making like millions of dollars a year. They're gonna be fucked, like fucked out of work, because <laughs> it's just this whole thing is like liquidated everything they had, and if you had any leverage on. In any of your positions, the fucking downdraft that just happened, not to be all fucking Wall Street bets Reddit, but so many people are not coming back from this. Like, I remember when 9 11 happened, right? After 9 11, no, wait, fuck that. Go back before 9 11, dot com crash in 99, 2000. I was working at fucking Little Brown and Company, the publisher in Boston, and there were guys there in the mailroom who'd been working there for 45 fucking years. Their kids' college education was in their 401k. I knew a guy who went from 220 grand down to like 72. What the fuck? We're going under 20. Oh, definitely, dude. Yeah, we're going under 20k. I mean, I personally think the natural zone of of all of this is way lower than we've been doing under Trumpy, because he was all just you know, gigging the you know, juicing the returns for these guys and you know whatever he says it doesn't mean anything. He's just been fucking gassing Wall Street. That's how you do it. Because they have the money, and then they'll get behind you, and they'll give you the money, and you'll get reelected. It's fucking basic. It's the way it's been forever. They all say different shit. Some say it's smarter. Some say it's dumber. But you know, it's I, I don't. Have, <laughs> there's so many things that you just can't get mad at Trump about because he's not unique, you know, at all. Like they all do it. So I don't know. Um, a little bit of it. What did I get? Oh yeah, I got that. Did we talked about that last night. Oh my god, I pulled some fucking weird shit. So we were. I did the video where I talked about these ultra vivid scene twelve inches, and this was the the because we like MTV. I because four AD they just had whatever relationship with MTV that their shit was getting played, and it wasn't like nothing. The Pixies did well ish. I mean, over there, not here. Um, but <clears throat> I don't know. There was, did Kurt Rausk, oh, did Kurt Rausk catch wind of my, I sincerely doubt it. <laughs> I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't remember. <clears throat> it is weird when I think back. Cause like when I deleted the videos, most of them had, like most of them had around 10,000 views. There were a couple, like the shoegaze ones were way, one of the shoegaze ones was like 52. And the Kurt Cobain one was, I mean the 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 Brian the CB the one with Camper Van Beethoven where I'm complaining about the Future of Music initiative. I don't even know if that one ever cracked ten. Um, but who's reached out to me after being name dropped? Uh, the dude from Bedhead. <laughs> he didn't. I mean that was from the Pitchfork review. Um, no, it's weird. People are weird about it. People are totally weird about it. They don't. They don't want to like talk about it or admit that they have watched them or whatever but it's all the only people who are watching are like music scene dorks so it's kind of a closed loop you know but they, that's the point right they're all the ones trying to promote themselves and they get names and then younger kids are like oh wow they're famous they write for pitchfork and then they're like it's just this you know again it's like a liberal arts day camp i don't you know fucking know but this thing is so so gorgeous the she screamed one. It's because it's paper. It's cardstock, so it's super thick, um, and it's just man. They spared no fucking expense. Like you talk about how much money gets. You know, this is like factory records level indulgence of a band that had done nout. And it's not even like a good. <laughs> It's like like not even a good the music you know wasn't that great. This is yes, but this was way better. This had like a good version of an 
it had really cool like the single mix was way better on staring at the sun and crash was on it which because that guy had just died i guess right around this time the guy he was in that earlier band with who died of aids um god that band was so bad i don't know if the drummer who had uploaded those to youtube took him down again but i definitely would have are there any significant musicians you dislike from really really came around and loving loving uh, um yeah that video was fucking brutal to look at wasn't it jesus um hated and came around to loving that's kind of strong i don't know i mean generally like if i never liked it it didn't grab me initially it's kind of not gonna i mean i you know i talked about swerve driver was one i came around on for sure because i fucking hated them as a kid and then you know people talk around you know like you're involved or talking about shoegaze or whatever and people always talk about mezcal and and um you know the one before it with whatever and like never lose that feeling is fucking awesome the single edit the album version it like the single edit never lose that feeling is way better than the album version for me i just it just goes on way too long but like duel is should be a nine minute anthem just like you know moose and and all those other bands who had their fucking run on jam song um but yeah i would say sword driver is a really good example of that like lush i i will never listen to lush i can't stand them i've never i've tried repeatedly awful hate that shit it's just such bad proxy cocteau twins robin guthrie having a hard on for her and like pff, fuck that i just wasn't into it um but yeah i definitely came around as work driver on the first two records um and they're they're good they're really good the drummer's fucking terrible but you know he's got a really cool voice he was a really good looking guy that was another big thing um kitchen's a distinction um i never i they're the same as when i first started i was like ah uh, you know Super reverby, mid tempo wash, you know, like trash can Sinatra's, Kitchens of Distinction, million mid 80s college rock, you know, bands, arty bands. They, they're indistinguishable to me. I mean, I've met a couple of people, you know, probably Ilk Sore people back in the day who are like massive KOD psychos. And I'm like, where could you be made? How could, how could anyone evolve to the point like the chameleons too? Chameleons and Kitchens of Distinction and, and Felt even. Like snakes that crinkled their heads to death or whatever. Like there are people who just will fucking this is the height of music and it's the most like banal, inane, you know, posy shit because everybody was trying to make themselves out to be some fucking I don't know, like, you know, house of love, same thing. It's like everyone was trying to do the U2 thing, mostly. That's really what like people forget that. U2 was you know, U2 was way more of an exemplar of how you can sell a shitload of records um, than even REM, you know, because Bono, you know, you get a big fucking superstar front man. So everyone was trying to do that. I only meant that regarding, I guess, Guy Chadwick because, you know, I mean, he's he laughs about himself now. They all do. Kurt Rousk laughs about himself. So you just go through periods where you've got an audience and you've got the press's ear and it you just you got to have fun with that i would rather be i'd rather be embarrassed of shit i did when i had you know anyone's attention than because otherwise nobody's going to remember you know what i mean like you gotta you have to have done something funny or shot your mouth off or whatever to leave an impression you know positive or negative you can you know cash from chaos you can pull the mclaren bullshit Guy Chadwick is a sexy bastard. He is. He's a fucking hot boy. He's still hot. Way fucking hotter than me. <laughs> um, this is a really good one. So I don't even know. So I don't know if you can get this or the edition that I have, but um, seriously, really recommend this book. Like if you're if you're just big into music generally, the way this book goes into the crazy fucking story of public image limited and all the people this is the key thing because like Leiden's the most famous rock star on the fucking planet you know and sid dies and like it's all and he goes and does pill right but like all the people and like how fucked on heroin levine like the and like jeanette lee too she's in here and there's just 
unbelievably cool fucking like vintage photos of it when it was coming together. And yeah, exactly. The hardcover. It's so nice. It's like that, that killer binding. It's just it's such feels so substantial. And it's the really, you know, like thin, small print, you know, it's not like it's a bullshit, like my book or, you know, these other series where it's like, you know, this could have been, it's a pamphlet, you know, it's like a little love letter thing. Like what Morrissey did with James Dean when he was a kid. But, um, the, the, this thing just goes on and on so deep and it's just such good storytelling. Um, it's just so well written in such minutia. Like I would compare, it's only this thick, right? But I would compare it to my magpie eyes, the book about creation records. It's just, you start reading it and you're like, you can like imagine yourself walking down this particular street in like Camden or something in fucking London. And you just, it's like you're there and the, almost no music books have the, the authorial breadth authority i guess what no it's not an oral history this is written it includes tons and tons of inline quotes and stuff from the players but um it's just like everything they did is torn apart and and kind of you know explained um oh god what the fuck is he drinking rubina oh my god yeah this is a you know there's just just even the pictures in this are so funny because like John Wobble is like completely fucking shit faced and just like leaning against the wall. And you know, Keith Jean is just like, he's downed a bottle of whatever just to wake himself out of a fucking coma. Yeah. He, that gets explained in like 50 different places. The jaw wobble thing. Um, everybody just got stupid names, you know, by friends or whatever. Um, Oh yeah. This is the best picture. This is when he was in Jamaica and Richard Branson was trying to get him to join Devo. And um, yeah, I know it sucks. Be I don't know why. I have two copies of it because I, <laughs> I had lent it to a friend and uh, I'd lent it to a friend and then he got sick. And um, I just figured I was never going to see it again. Um, and then after he died, his wife found, a, found it and was like, you know, holy shit, this is yours and blah, blah, blah. I was like, just, you know, whatever. And she mailed it back to me, but I'd bought, an, I'd bought another copy by that, uh, by that point. But that thing is, that thing's fucking ridiculous. That shadow players, the pink, um, factory book, I think that's upstairs. Those are books that it's just like, like someone was able to write probably in total 50 pages about Stockholm monsters. Like what the fuck? That's crazy. But yeah, this, if you can, I don't know what this, look it up on Amazon. Like, I don't know what it's going for in the used market, but it's so fucking good. What else did I pull out? So the, oh yeah. This is like, this was another weird thing that happened. This, uh, I was telling you, I was telling you about like the guy who passed away. He was like, <laughs> We didn't, we didn't actually have comparable taste in anything like at all. Oh my God. Fucking seven ninety nine. That better be already bought. Um, when he died, he died of cancer, but when he died, his wife sent me all of his CDs and like records and it's all late nineties, big beat IDM special editions. Like, cause he was totally loaded. Like he would buy the dumbest shit. Um, because he just would, you know, he, he, he it's like the like what I said in the Apex video, how I was like so stupid about that for like two years. He he was like, oh, I left it upstairs. Um, he he would just buy the weirdest, the dumbest shit, like like the the plastic sealed version of Never Neverland. Like what? Why would like who? It's just like <laughs> the dumb, like this is big, dumb packaging hype bullshit from Moax, you know? Um, and, and so there's just like, I have like two or three crates of, of stuff that like is not even really in my wheelhouse at all. I mean, I liked a lot of big beat stuff. I, I still I, like, uh, I mean, chemical brothers were fucking great and they deserve to be huge, but like the verve remixed, like, thing is so bad it's just awful like felix the house cat remixing nina simone oh god 
Um, it's so, so fucking cheesy. It's just shit like that. And like, yeah, baby, Jedi Knights. <laughs> he, that whole, <laughs> the, that whole creative shit is so funny. Like, it's just, because also he was living in England for a while. So a lot of them are things that you just can't, um, you could never get, you know? Um, so he's a good dude though. I mean, it's like, it's like the, you know, it, like it, I knew he wasn't like down or like, it's hard to describe. Like he's kind of square, I guess. So I'd put it, but like in a way that it just didn't register. He didn't care or whatever. What else did I pull out? Oh yeah. This thing, I want to talk about this thing. So like before, before streaming, like we, you know, wasn't a thing. MP3s were a thing, but you know, streaming wasn't. You guys know like the C700 Go series we did out of Ilksor, or everybody picked a year, and then you tried to fit as many MP3s on a CDR as you could, and that was how you did that. Well, this guy Ian Masters went fucking off, and uh, he made sixty copies, <laughs> thirty-two out of sixty of this um, 10 disc box set about 1981. So you think like um, Matt, Matthew Perpetua is doing, he's like doing yearly mixes cause he's, you know, I guess he's got some time on his hands right now. So, I mean, it's a good exercise, especially if you're a writer or whatever and you want to keep working in music, you start doing research on, on years and you know, it's really good. But yeah, Ian did, he did like a full booklet um, of, of, all of all of this stuff for uh, every one of these CDs for 1981, and I, you know, I guess he made 60 of them, and I have number 32, and it was all just off Ilksor, and he actually like, I don't know what this guy's story is, but like, he actually screen printed the the little codes for the booklet on each CD, and they're um, they're press CDs. Uh, oh no, they're CDRs. Yeah, they're CDRs. Okay. Rye data, yeah, they're Rye data CDRs, but they're the cool silver ones. But yeah, it's uh, 345 bands, 395 songs, 21 hours, 10 discs, one year, and it. I mean, it's really good. It's it's spread across tons of different bands, but you know, of course, all the stuff you'd expect. Um, but it is cool. Like I ripped it in in uh, 420. I ripped it, and I, I I've got that stored somewhere. I'd write daily reviews of albums released each month of the deck after three ran out of gas. Yeah, I know exactly. And that was my whole idea. Like that was what I wanted to do for the website. I still think whatever matrix of, of artificial motivating kind of rule that you assign to a website, you, you use time, you use uh, what was in the top 10 or what was the number three. This is the stuff Tom Ewing always does. And these are the things that help motivate you to write because they give you like, you know, I fucking hate how much people are using the word praxis these days, but like they give you motivation and they give you a framework and then that's how you can be productive. Um, and that was what I wanted to do for sure with a site was um, just come up with ways to motivate, motivate the writers. And um, cause that's the biggest thing, but the only thing that motivates writers is money, you know, it never changes. And that's what you find when you, you're in a position to try and do this stuff. Doesn't work. Makes you take chances. Yeah, it totally breaks down your snobbery for sure. Cause you'll, you're set in kind of what you've heard and what you've experienced. Right. And then you go back and because you're going through this, like let's say you're weak on disco or whatever, um, or some other genre. Like when I did the 1976 one, uh, that really improved my knowledge of real like Jamaican, dub and reggae and even root um stuff because there were some big hits coming out at that time mid 70s jamaican you know all that was going over to england and was inspiring punk and whatever so i mean yeah it's those avenues um and like really wimpy pop music when i did the 86 one you know because you if you the quality of the mix is is a result of the you know the entire you know the the depth that you go like you're not just dragging MP3s of the charts. That's stupid. You want it to actually sonically, musically flow, and it's like you know 128 songs. But I spent a ton of time on that because I loved it. And you get you know all those, the, all that's that feedback loop you create with the information. Those things take you out of your 
you know, scene stir uh, identity reinforcement type music. And that's the best thing for anybody. And I mean, all that shit, I've been writing about this for fucking 14, 15 years, like about how all of that was going to deteriorate. And it was just going to be this like, you know, feedback loop on the internet and who knows what this is going to look like. Yeah. The C700s are on the Spotify. Yep. And they're almost totally complete. I think there, I did other people's too. There were uh, like, I tried to, I was thinking about putting them all in there, but like once I started doing the sixties ones and stuff, it was like, cause first of all, some people didn't really take it that seriously. Like uh, Andy, what's his name? I don't know. He did one for 80, 80, 1980, I think. And it only had like 70 something songs on it. And it was like, come on, man. And they were like just thrown on there like a folder. Matos did a really, really good one for 89, I think. Um, he did 89, I'm pretty sure. And that was awesome. Um, yeah, there were just some people who took it super seriously. Like I made funny covers. Like I, I had that fucking... Uh, I don't know if it was Kevin Keegan, but like I did a mock up of this cover to so with him and like, you know, it's just, it's all, you gotta, it's just great ways to get the, the pot flowing, get creative juices going. And it also gives you a little bit of a competitive index when you have other people doing it. So that thing was fun, man. That, that should be remembered. Like, you know, if they ever write some stupid nerdy book about, you know, this era of music journalism or whatever, you know, Ilk Store totally is going to have its place. Just like when you read the, in their own right book, and they talk about ITV and they talk about, you know, fringe people there, you know, all these people should have their due, whether, you know, I can't stand them or fell out with them or think they're fucking awesome. You know, like I still think Tom Ewing's the fucking man. He's the fantastic writer and he just still keeps going and finds way to keep, finds ways to keep himself engaged. Uh, freaky trigger. Um, and you know, like the dude, you know, everybody's been talking about cause he killed himself or whatever. Uh, the K-Punk guy, if it was Mark Fisher, what's his name? I forget. I was never a fan of his, you know, just totally never was into his stuff. I thought the whole thing they were doing was just ridiculous, frankly. I just I wasn't into any of that shit. But that's a whole, you know, we, we talk about the university types and whatever. And the, the whole way that is in England is so fucking different from how it is in America. Because the Anorak thing is so much more. I don't know, fastidious or what the word is, but they, they just really get way the fuck out there when you cross that certain kind of like, you know, stairway to heaven poster thing. Yeah. It's not talked about, but everybody knows it. it's just, nobody's, we're not old enough yet. Like I'm probably am, but like in another five, 10 years or something, you know, I think there was somebody a couple of years ago who tried to write an article maybe for noisy or something about, the big forums like what were the big forums and because 4chan had this whole mainstream media crossover everybody talks about 4chan and moo and stuff and it's like that was so late like <laughs> it's a totally different generation you know the early stuff like pre opinion pitchfork media smackdown all those boards all those sites everyone was starting to add boards to their sites and and um yeah and you know, like we are the music makers too all those big ones ilksor was massive um it was like you could tell, like you you could tell you had these communities and you would cross them, because I was I posted on all this stuff, and and that would be like how you satisfied that aspect of your music fandom or your personality, like on Ilksor everybody was totally kicked up to ten and being completely ridiculous and trying to be way too obnoxious and way too funny and always making stupid in jokes and shit, and then and but like in a kind of a more, you know, British way because that's it was Australian and British people mostly and like. Europeans and stuff. And then like, you know, over here, all the boards here would be driven by insecurity and paranoia and like scenes are bullshit. And like, am I indie enough? And am I punk enough? And so-and-so band sucks. And you know, the get up kids are assholes and they sold out or whatever. Um, Buddy heads forum just was just complete shit posting 24 seven. So it never took off. Opinion was like, you know, there was some self-policing stuff with some people who were just complete fucking psychos and assholes. And it, it got to a good kind of place. And that's, again, it's kind of what, you know, we do at the court a little bit is how it was then. I mean, it's just kind of common sense, whatever. Like, yeah, you can be funny, but like, I don't know, whatever. I'm rambling about that stupid. Um, oh, I was talking about in the first one. I was talking about how the, that shit from my basement, that's that Mission of Burma bootleg. It's all fucked up. And like the CDs are completely fucked. They're all just like they're caked with fucking shit on them. And but yeah, this girl, like, 
out of nowhere, I didn't know who she was. And like, I kind of was friendly with, you know, Peter Prescott around this time in the early, cause he was, he customized was ending and he was starting this kraut rock band that was actually really fucking good. Um, and he gave me all that stuff. I have all of it. He never put it out. Um, and there was this girl in San Francisco who, you know, who nobody knows. She must have had, I don't know what money or whatever. She followed them like all over the fucking country recording every show of their reunion and put these out herself. Like, yeah, they were printed on an inkjet printer and whatever, but it's just like, it's crazy. Like she, they're, they're like two, four CD sets of every show they played. This is only one of the boxes. I have like six and she made these with like paper, you know, wrapped around them. And it, it, I mean, I think there's like 50 CDs and basically she was really cagey about who she was giving them to. And then she found out that I kind of knew Peter and she was like, Oh, okay. You know, she was, I mean, she was almost like, well, how'd you get my name? I was like, Oh, princess fucking chill. But, um, yeah, I don't know. He, he was just like, I don't know what her deal is, man. <laughs> oh yeah. Cause I, I had the, the seven inch out last time the other night and i oh yeah shit so i don't have the the slip for this i forgot i found it now i have to remember where i put it but uh yeah this was this was the arizona record i bought this at kim's in new york city before i went to college or was it freshman year when did this come out 93 so yeah i think this was the fall of my senior year of high school, yes, I went down to visit my friend who was the year older and went to Sarah Lawrence. And we went to, um, it, I, maybe, no, I bought this at Kim's, 100% bought this. And Unrest, Unrest, the Galaxy 500s today, Unrest's Imperial, I think, this, or no, maybe it was the Goya, the red Goya 7-inch. I bought those at Kim's, and then we went to other music, and I can't remember what I bought there, but that was where I got this. And I ha let me see if I have the thing, because it's that's the only... In I mean... <laughs> I thought I put it over here. What the fuck? Didn't I put it over here? Whoa, shit. Fuck, I can't find it. I don't know. I can't find the insert, but I was telling you, this is the Princess Dragon Mom flyers and shit I have from Warren DeFever. <laughs> like all this weird shit back when I was buying his time stereotapes and shit. But I can't find the insert for Silver Jews, so I'll have to look for that. Did one, Who the fuck did I get this from? Is this... Who the, what the fuck is this? I don't remember... I seriously don't remember buying this. Who did I get this from? I don't remember. But I was the um there was this thing that oh, where the fuck is it? Oh, I can't find it, man. What a bummer. That's fucking annoying. I don't even know what half the shit is anymore. Yeah, yeah, I had all of his shit. I had bought like everything he had going on. And yeah, it definitely was not all good.
planet. So that's not gonna work. Where the fuck did I put it? God damn it. Okay, I got it. So that's the insert. Now is it the... Uh, that was in there. <sighs> Most of the worst and some of the best. Centrado. Straight from blue. The paper is like totally fucking faded. So funny. Shit's so bad. It's like all photocopied and shit. It's like fucking, I don't even know. It's like all fucking burned out and shit. But yeah. Lou Solo. I think I had, uh, he, yeah, so the, it's not like side one, side two. It's just like side one. And then I taped Rodan's Rusty on side two. <laughs> That's funny. I this I burn this fucking tape down painting houses and uh, the summer of ninety two, I think. Yeah, I'm assuming everyone knew that Malcolm was doing silver Jews back in the day. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, he fucking totally was. He was trying to hook him up. You know, he like everybody knew about it. It was you know, they played secret knowledge backroads on the peel session. Uh, which is, uh, you know, Berman wrote that song. It's his song. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Silver Jews for me after, uh, I was like a Starlight Walker. I, I like that a lot. Love that record. And I didn't, I didn't think, I mean, Natural Bridge I thought was okay. I know, um, that guy, what's his name? I did a video for his band, Holly of the Hills. We lost touch. He, he wrote a Van Morrison book, and I don't know. We just didn't keep touch with each other. But, um, yeah, what was I saying? Holly the Hills. What the hell is his name? He's, like, all over Twitter, and he's just, like, a nice guy. He's he's married or engaged to that uh, woman um, that's on Sacred Bones that does uh, the kind of, like, mega goth stuff um i don't know i'm blanking on all that shit because i'm getting coronavirus oh yeah and then i got i did pick this up this year um the first cd the first now cd ever released and i think i tweet not pharmacon no uh Ma M M M Maris maria marissa something like that What's her? I forget her name. Yeah, this is the first CD that now ever did. It's fucking crazy. The playlist, the it's like like David Bowie, Peter Gabriel, like it's unbelievable the shit that's on here. Like Queen, fucking UB40, Tears for Fears, Everybody Wants to Rule the World is like toward the end. I mean, it was kind of already had done its thing, but um, Marissa Naylor. Yeah, that's sorry. Yeah, that's who he's with i think they're still together i don't know we again i haven't talked to the guy in probably two years like the, so when i like deleted twitter and all that shit like so much i lost touch with all the twitter people and they don't even know if i'm real if i'm fake like no one knows because it, i got my fucking account got parked by some douchebag from opinion and they started fucking dming fucking teenage girls and shit and fucked everything up so whatever um yeah the pictures are awesome He, look at Tears for Fears. He, look at that hair, dude. That shit is fucking nice. Oh, that's a strong mullet. What was the other good pick in here? Oh, the Peter Gabriel picture is so awesome. So he's wearing like his like giant fucking scarf a curtain. I don't know what the fuck. And then look at look at Neil. Look at Pet Shop Boys. Yeah, dude. 
I need the Analord binder for my Yu-Gi-Oh cards. Let us buy your, let me buy your Analord binder. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think I'll probably hang on to that. And then I did a, I did a, uh, I haven't opened these to rip them. I did, I did tell you guys that I got them, but I got the whole 86 through 89 of uh, the C86 comps. These are so great. And I, you know, they're, you know, they're probably never going to come in print again. Cherry, I doubt Cherry would repress them, but they're so fucking good. Like, I don't give a crap about the original tape or the history of it. It's just like, just this this whole period of, kit, like we were talking about Kitchens of Distinction earlier, this whole period of like pre-shoegaze, but like after goth, and it's like Twee is not 100% conceptually there yet. Like a lot of these bands, they took themselves pretty seriously. Like, and it's just funny the bands that turned up, you know, like Snapdragons, the fucking Orchids, you know, Stone Roses are on this for the 88 one. Like, what are they doing on a C88, you know? But it's, they hadn't blown up. The Mock Turtles are on here, fucking Pale Saints, you know. Um, who else was a oh, Whirl? Whirl is another band that nobody remembers. And like the Laws were on the 89 one, you know? And it's just cool that Cherry did this huge like digging of all the shit that they owned. Um, and this is one of the things that would have been a huge part of the music supervisor videos, which is that all these labels have been buying up fucking all the publishing they can. Cherry, Red, Sub Pop, all these labels now have music supervision websites and they're hiring music supervision like liaisons because they make w so much more money syncing this shit than they ever would selling records. So if you go to Cherry Red, they have everything. They have the rights to Dinosaur Jr. for sync licensing through Cherry Red because they had the opportunity to bottom, um, to buy them. And it, Sub Pops, they're all doing it because they're gonna, you know, they're gonna make like 15, 10, 15 grand in some cases for a fucking totally unknown song to sync it in some fucking show. And it, it's just, it's so crazy. This is gonna change like everything about how music is getting around. Like we talk about how TikTok and you look at the Spotify charts and everything when some girl does a fucking TikTok video of her doing dances and she ends up on fucking Jimmy Fallon and my daughter's watching all this bullshit. Um, what happens, you know, these fucking TikTok songs, like she, I ask her what they are and I look them up and it's like, they're not even signed. It's out of nowhere. And it has like fucking 50 million views on YouTube. It's fucking crazy. Like we, like we all old people, and like punks and heads and indie people, we we think about indie as like being outside of the mainstream, underground, DIY. I'll sell each other the records, and you're gonna get my band camp, all that shit, right? This, this TikTok thing and these nexuses, nexuses like TikTok, there it's fucking off planet, man. It's so exactly, it's like the Gong Show, um. And it's, it's, the numbers are fucking mental. And like, the, but of course it's TikTok and it's YouTube. So there's shitloads of bots that are totally inflating all this shit. Um, and so it's like war. It's the same kind of war that I talked about in the, well, I wrote about in the huge article where I talk about, um, you know, channel stuffing and Def Leppard's hysteria and then, you know, printing, pressing, 20, 30 million copies of records and then like, you know, all kinds of shenanigans to have that appear as a sale at a certain time and get it in the top 10 and then you can put it, put that on the side of the record, including the top 10 hit and then that brings it up. It's just payola and the radio. Um, it's not any different. The, the, the way it's happening is different, but the outcome is the same. And like all these unprepared little kids like fucking, you know, Lil Pump and whatever, Gucci Gang, fucking out of nowhere, they're, everyone's talking about them for three weeks and they're gone. They didn't even have time to make money. I don't know how Post Malone did it. Um, I mean, I, like I said, with what he's been buying and shit, I think he's fucked. I think he has bridge loans out the ass and he is going to come up a bad, you know, cautionary, corny music star uh, anecdote in five, three to five years. Like, I don't, but he, his thing, his voice is like recognizable. It resonates with kids. Like they, he's like an emotionally kids like cry to his songs. I don't, I don't mock that. Like, it's just, 
Yeah, he did. I know. I heard, I've heard various stories about what, you know, his background was and everything fine, whatever. Um, there's no question the guy's production, like that, that fake, you know, uh, auto tune warble that he throws in the, he's got little sonic signatures and that's all you need. It's like, like I, I always make the joke about Billy Ocean. All these bands are like Billy Ocean, like, uh, Derulo, Jason Derulo, like all the, they're just new Billy Oceans. Like Billy Ocean came out and his shit was so smooth that it, it was just like, you, holy shit, you know, Caribbean Queen was just like, what the fuck? And he had like three or four big hits or, or like, or Journey, you know, the, 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 you, you make a template and if it's unique enough and identifiable enough, um, you own that territory and you just become, it, it, you can, you, you can go back to end, like Fleetwood Mac, all these bands that have just taken off and, and owned a time or whatever. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons that, that, that these patterns have changed, mostly involving the lack of money. And how can we take the attention that we used to be able to control with physical media, how can we take that attention and monetize it? The only way we can do it is selling ads. That's why Billie Eilish has to look like a fucking runway model. I mean, if you compare what Billie Eilish is doing visually with what Madonna did when she blew up, Madonna, like, was sexually extroverted, which is cheap and basic, but she was conscious of it, her choice. Um, Billie Eilish is totally the inverse of that, right? A um, lot of fucking, you know, she's spent, and her family or brother, they have spent so much time strategizing, you know, I mean, everyone knows she's had management talent agencies working with her since she was like 13. Um, and they pulled it off, whatever. I don't know. There's a bunch of different ways this shit can go, and it's fine. Uh, what else did I pull? I pulled, oh, I pulled a ton of seven inches. A ton of good seven inches. We were talking about fucking San Diego, Screamo, like people, if I like drive like Jehu, what else would I like, and all that shit. Like, oh man, I pulled some fucking good shit. I did talk about this band, Candle. I think I posted it in the cord. This fucking record is so good. So the dude from this went on to join, I think, Click Attack, Click Attack, Atawi. Um, I don't. I there's no way you're gonna. Actually, you know what? Who knows? Maybe it's on some comp or something. But uh, Green Grass and, and Silver. It's on YouTube. Actually, I know it's on YouTube. I did check that. So you can you can probably listen to this on YouTube. They were really fucking good. I liked them. Wrenched Records, Del Mar, California. Fucking skate or die. Um, I don't, I don't remember what the insert is on this. I don't think it had one. That was another thing that was funny. Like emo, screamo, indie, like uh, after like 95 ish or something, the whole like insert photocopied, uh, you know, diatribe or cutesy arty bullshit like that totally died. Everything got stripped back and it was like super stark and it was a big break from, how things had been in the early and, and mid nineties, like huge difference in the whole vibe. Oh, this is jam kids and haunt you down. So this is the single that came with, uh, with crooked rain inside the actual gatefold LP was, uh, this jam kids and haunt you down these. I mean, I'm sure these got they've fucking reissued everything eight ways from Sunday. So I'm sure it's on the thing, but it was just like a little, they literally just, you know, pressed it. It's super fucking flimsy, shitty vinyl. Threw it in a white sleeve and threw it on the inside. Like, I don't know who they paid to slip these in fucking Crooked Rain, but the pivot will eventually come. Blah, blah. No more compilation book sketches in my shadow. But yeah, I guess that's kind of what happened. Uh, I already showed you guys this last night. Oh, wait. Is this the one that has the. No, it's the same shit. I was impressed, though. Like, if you ever got the single that I did, I showed it in the last one. The Static Caravan pressed this on such fucking thick vinyl. It's so sturdy. Like, you can't even flex it. It's glass. Um, and it sounds really fucking good, considering it's like some bullshit gold wave file I fucking did. Like, it sounds awesome. Old, oh man, I had to... Yeah, so one of my ex-girlfriends wrote some shit on this to me uh and i had to write over it and 
marker because I was emotionally traumatized. So this is a one-off Lou Barlow did um, with Eric Matthews and Bob Fay called Belt Buckle. This is sort of like right before the folk implosion idea, and it's fucking awesome. If you Google this up, it's Lou Barlow. It's going to be on YouTube. Um, there is uh, the end of this song is so awesome. It's Judas Suicide, I think, the first song. There's this huge fucking screaming awesome guitar or bass solo that just punches in out of nowhere in it. It's like Keep the Glove. Like think about Keep the Glove, the Dinosaur Jr. song. It's that same kind of thing. And I'm at one point I know it was on um, it was on YouTube. But yeah, Judas Suicide from Belt Buckle. Or get it on Discogs. It's probably four but no one knows what this fucking is. Um, it was on Sonic Bubblegum, which was like one of the biggest Boston area indies. Uh, they were college, you know, label started in Brighton. They ran for a good, I don't even know if it was like a decade because they still put out shit when I was in college and after they put out Tugboat Annie, this like twee shoegazy band, um, four thirty six, four dollars and 36 cents for Judas Suicide. Get it. Only caution, um, with that is that it has the, uh, you need the actual adapter. It's not, um, you can't actually like. Put it on the pin. So, a lot of people who are like super into vinyl don't even have those. But I mean, most players are sold to them, I guess. Um, yeah, Sonic Bubblegum. If you go on Discogs and go through them, they they were really good. I mean, considering how bad a lot of the acts were, like the just instamatic shitty bands. Like, I mean, I don't need to be a dick, but like that dog. Oh, there were so many bad, and I hated fucking Ivy too. That band was so full of shit. There were just a lot of really bad middling bands, and he was at least doing some sort of AR with his label, or they were. I think he had multiple people at that time. Then I made the joke about that Jessamine Flying Saucer Attack being limited edition. This is another one. Jessamine and um, uh, what was the other band? Uh, Transparent Thing. What the fuck? A band called Transparent Thing from Portland, Oregon. Limited edition of 1,000. <laughs> But yeah, it's this this I don't remember this being any good. It's on Darla. I like played it once and forgot about it. Um, what's this? Oh, Asteroid Number Four. This was a winning winning little band. They were pretty cool. Um, you know, space rocky, whatever. This was late nineties. Um, I don't know. They were around, and then this is see all this stuff is like Boston Homer stuff that I all had in the same thing. This is that magic hour heads down again. It, like if this is on twist, this is twisted village. This is Damon put it out himself. Um, if this is on Discogs, like you should own this. Forget that you can stream it or get it on their Bandcamp or whatever. If this isn't going for crazy money, and it's another one that you need the adapter, um, it's just so fucking cool hearing this on vinyl because it's a drone piece. So the crackles like work with it, and it really accentuates it. I fucking love that thing. This was pretty shameless. So. Frida Boner from um, Frida Love, Frida Boner. <laughs> what the fuck? I'm thinking of Boner Records. Frida Love for, from the Blake Babies started this band with a guy when they when she moved to Indiana, um, and I actually love them. Uh, I think they're really fucking cool. They're called Mysteries of Life. They had a pretty sizable deal with RCA because at that time in the mid '90s, everyone got signed. Like Shauna Carmody got signed out of being in the Swirlies, and she got like thousands of dollars to do a syrup USA record. It was great. Like they were Mary Timoney did like one record on Matador and then capital was like, oh, we can make her a star. Let's bring her up to the big leagues. You know, just like they had the only reason they bought half of Matador was for Liz fair. Like fact capital records paid 49% of the value of Matador records full stop to have a minority, a minority interest. And all they wanted was Liz fair. They just wanted to make Liz fair a fucking huge pop star. They tried, you know, Atlantic tried it with Juliana Hatfield first, right? So she was the first project out of like the new, you know, women in rock, this whole thing. There was a, this legitimately, there was a really strong, good dialogue about, you know, women in music and, and everything, you know, it's forget Riot Girl. Like Riot Girl was actually late. It was super late. Like the labels were starting to pay attention, but you got to read, if you haven't read the oral history that Jess Hopper and a bunch of other people and, and, um, one, I think one of the, the Pelly twins was involved in it. They did Vanity Fair or whatever it was, or Vox. I don't fucking know. They're all the same. They did an oral history of the Lilith Fair 
and of what it was like at that time. And all the artists to a T are like, yeah, we've already got one. We've already got Cheryl Crow. No more female artists. We we have Jewel. We're, we're fine. We're full up. Like, it was fucking horrible, right? But Julian Hadfield got a huge deal. She got a $400,000 check for her publishing when she signed her record deal. Immediately. Half a million dollars from Zomba. No joke. It's in her book. Um, and uh, she got $400,000 without off of... She had done an indie on Mammoth, which was owned by this guy. It's like this screaming douchebag. Everyone fucking hates him. He's now like a wannabe venture capital jack off who has no fucking clue what he's doing he ran mammoth records right and they he had the blake babies and like vanilla train wreck and some other bullshit um and so hey babe was he put that out and then she was already talking to atlantic and she got signed but so frida after the blake babies broke up was in indiana and she was with this guy and the the label's a little bit unsubtle about uh, the mysteries of life's background, <laughs> but that the the first album, keep it like a secret, keep it a keep a secret, not keep it like that's built to spill. Keep a secret. Um, the the title track and hesitate, and uh, there's like three fucking awesome jangly kind of shuffly, you know, with like cello in it. Um, just really good twangy straight ahead jangle, REME feelies kind of thing. Um, she played with bats. Um, she played with batted sticks with the you know the fuzzy tips um and it was clear it was kind of cool it was uh off green clear vinyl little promo single they did when this came out this was 95 going into 96 yeah i love that song hesitate hesitate and get behind me this is my band oh yeah this was my pop punk band in fucking college we all wore uh, ski masks and helmets and bullshit and we're making fun of the pop punk crossover this is right when green day blew up in 94 um experience um yeah i mean the single is called need a drummer because i quit the band before they put it out because i was like okay this isn't funny anymore you know we played to like 1500 people opening for the figs and the manager of jonathan fire eater wanted to sign us in new york on the medicine label he was like you're the best drummer i've ever seen in my life i have to fucking sign you i was like dude i the rest of the band is right fucking here. That's pretty fucking uncool. And uh, he was completely like taken aback. And because those guys were fucking crazy drug pigs, Jonathan Fire Eater were nuts. Like, in that whole scene, this is right before, like, this is two years before the strokes kind of get together. And they've said in interviews and shit that Jonathan Fire Eater was this huge influence on them. That band was fucking huge immediately. New York scene. And they played like 10 shows and no one went to them. But like the word of mouth in New York is a freight train. And people, they really blew it. Like they had a big fucking shot around about 96 or 97. I can't remember what it was. Um, and they blew it because the singer was just like a total fucking drug casualty. Um, but yeah, his label, his, the guy who ran the medicine label saw us. And he literally was like, I have to get in between you because I know you're going to get signed to a major. And I was just like, how much fucking coke are you on right now? Like, we're, we're fucking college kids from Skidmore. We drove down here in a fucking to Mercury Topaz. Uh, no, no, this was the, the Team Taurus wagon, a Ford Taurus wagon. I was just, I mean, I didn't say any of this shit to him, but I'm just like, dude, we're, if you want to talk about something, like, we can, we can talk, but like, thanks. I'm glad you think I'm a good drummer, but. It's ridiculous. Such a dickhead. But yeah, it's 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 funny because we actually had some really funny, good punk songs, um, and they're not really on here. The stuff that's on here is um, like the main guy. He was actually a really good guitar player from the Jersey hardcore scene. He was in an awesome um, band that sounded kind of a lot like Sam I Am actually, and he was playing with all those Jersey hardcore bands in like ninety two, ninety three. Um, it was like a legit major you know, band in that region. Um, this was all like the skate scene, street skating. Like when you, if you watch the movie kids, like that came out in 95, I think that movie feels like 1992. It feels exactly like being in New York city in 1992, like Washington, like being in Washington square park, buying shitty acid and speed out my friend's dorm on the corner of, cause he lived in the NYU dorm that was a butts Washington square park. And it was just like, it was exact that scene when they're in that park with all those kids, even though it's three years later and it's all like fashioned out with the outfits and shit, it felt exactly fucking like that. It was just like all these dudes in super huge khaki painter pants with like fucking triple XL 
sweatshirts, smoking fucking joints and right in front of cops and like grinding fucking 50 fifties around there and just, you know, like slamming their boards down right in front of cops and taking off and all that, you know, little kids just dicking around. And, um, they thought they were badass and the cops were just like, dude, like, are you kidding me? Um, yeah, it was funny. Oh God, that's so gross. I'm not going to show that. Um, tiger bomb. I love this. this is, you know, they sold out or whatever, but. Chris in a cure shirt watching a guy get trucked. Pretty much. Yeah. It's, it's pretty much like that. I never I never saw any fucking fights like that, right? Nope. I mean, the only place I ever saw real actual violence was the channel in Boston. And there was just this whole crew of fuck up suburban shitheads that used to just go into hardcore shows in Boston and just intimidate people. They were, you know, they would dress like skinheads, whether they were racist or not. Nobody fucking knew there, there were, you know, this is like when the sharp things, you know, happening. Um, but I, I definitely like, I got decked at the channel once by a huge, you know, fucking skinhead jacket asshole. Um, he just fucking absolutely dropped me, just shoved me so hard. I just fell straight flat on my back. It was fucking terrifying. I was like 16. This guy was probably like 23. He was fucking huge. I was like a skinny little pale fucking stone 16 year old kid snuck into the fucking channel, you know, like what the fuck it sucked. I mean, the Boston hardcore scene was so fucking dumb and so violent um, in the late eighties because straw dogs and like they became the FUs became straw dogs. And then the straw dogs were like basically wink, wink racist band. Like it was the crowds they were attracting. It was just awful. So bad evolution control committee. Rocked by rape. <laughs> this is, you know, one of the great, you know, original cut up. You know, it goes pretty much uh, plunder phonics to this guy. <gasps> and um, this single, Rocked by Rape, is stupid. It's the one that's Dan, Ra Dan Rather, you know, newscast over ACDC. That's, you know, obviously whipped cream. Uh, the one where he does the public image limited with, uh, with the exotic song under it. That Rebel Without a Pause is fucking hilarious so this is that weird rob crow single fantasy mission force it's called circus atari because that was like everybody's favorite atari game um no plunder phonics is the first mashup john oswald if you listen to dab his one of uh michael jackson or the james brown one brown or the led zeppelin one um jesus gonna make me my dying bed da -da 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 um oswald was on he was the guy um and negative land, obviously. But um, yeah, this is Rob Crow. Um, uh, P. Hicks. She was the she's the woman from Thingy and Heavy Vegetable. And uh, yeah, this is another one of those just fucking bizarres. Chula Vista. Um, and it has this song on it called uh, I Can't Believe P. Believe the Alien Autopsy. So when Fox did that fake alien autopsy show... I guess P Hicks like thought it could be real or got into a stoned argument or something with them about it. Um, but I can't believe P believe the alien autopsy is actually a pretty funny song. Uh, it's sort of like my SK five, that um, thingy song. It's just, these are all just super short jokes. And I think this is Rob Crow, like drinking vodka out of a baby bottle on the back. I'm not sure, but um, you know, I, I interviewed him um, over email. I interviewed Rob in 97 or 98. I asked him about that single and he's like, you know, typically he's like, Oh, you're the one who found that. Like, you know, obviously it's a nothing. tile breaker and the chameleon, Eric Matsunaga, Eric Matsunaga, man, Eric Matsunaga was, he was supposed to be like the Bob Weston figure, like the next big indie producer. I don't remember what he ended up doing, but yeah, that's, this is not even a really good single, but Paul, those, uh, Tilebreaker and Chameleon Tower. It was like two demos they did with Eric Masanaga. Vitreous Humor, man. My Midget. This was a great fucking early post Rocky, you know, coming out of emo instrumental. I love this fucking song. It's on there, the red, you know, comp they did after they broke up. This new Victoria Theater and uh, My Midget. But My Midget's awesome. It was a good one. The Low Christmas single. Yep. Got that. If you were born today in Blue Christmas, 
they put it out themselves. Um, I think. Oh no, no, this is Wurlitzer Jukebox. Wurlitzer Jukebox was a great label. Look up Wurlitzer Jukebox on fucking Discogs. I'd get anything they have. I mean, if you're gonna take a flyer, it's not like it's gonna cost anything. Yeah, here their fucking catalog is inside. I didn't even realize this. Where were they? Where were they based? Hurley, Aetherston, Aetherston Stone, Warks. Jesus, CB nine two ND. Um, yeah, what was on this? Apples and Stereo had a single with them. Ganger, who I fucking was in my post rock thing, they put their first single out. They did the they had an amp single that's really hard to find. That's really good. Tullycraft Pram. Um, basically, amp was their big shit for a long time, and then. Oh my God, the Bitter Springs. I fucking remember that. I think I have that. Yeah, fuck. It's pretty cool. Wurlitzer Jukebox was also trying to do the um, Simple Machines thing. They put out like a little guide to starting your own label in England. And they were like, yeah, send a self-addressed stamped envelope and we'll send it to you. It's pretty cool. This is that Drive Like Jehu, Bullet Train to Vegas single. The fucking song shreds like a mother. Ah, yes. Apathy's Last Kiss by the Smashing Pumpkins. My favorite song of theirs by far. It is the B-side to Today on Hut. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I fucking love this. Love this record. They put a fucking sticker on it, unfortunately. But, um, yeah, Apathy's Last Kiss is, like, easily probably my favorite. Yeah, amp amp was good. Those World Trade Jukebox ones, up, ones I get it. Yeah, this is cool. I mean, this is when colored vinyl, major labels started doing colored vinyl again. Like it became a big fad right around the time that Schoolhouse Rock compilation came out. Everyone started doing crazy retro '70s colored vinyl, like you know, clear orange vinyl, No More Kings, Pavement. That's somewhere. Um, and it just uh, it was just a trend at that time, and it just kind of died out when they were like, "You spent what on this?" Don't tell me that's coming out of your marketing budget. That doesn't fucking scan at all. And so it would be a problem. I think we're just going to end up doing seven inches because I've been on this for an hour. And we are cooped up with four fucking kids for COVID watch. So did I see the pumpkins back in their heyday? Yes, I saw them twice. Uh, Jimmy Chamberlain is so good that they can't be bad live. But the whole like somewhere over the rainbow shit in the middle of silver fuck was when I was like, this guy is truly a world-class asshole. Like Billy Corgan is a huge fucking douchebag. Um, to, to start singing that. So pa impassioned, like he was just drowning in the adoration. He was so fucking stoked to be famous and everybody knew as soon as Cobain killed himself, it was all going right on Billy Corgan and man, did that motherfucker run with it. Him and Evan Dando. Cobain died. It was like, these two guys. Um, and, you know, whatever, man. Fucking Siamese Stream is one of the best rock albums ever. It belongs alongside Houses of the Holy. It's a great fucking album. I don't take anything away from what he did. I, I always talk about um, all the singles before and around. Um, I Am One and fucking Starla was the big song for all of us. Starla, that big, you know, thing. That, that compilation... Uh, with um, Frail and Bedazzled, and I forget the fucking blanket on the name, um, Star Kitty and all that shit. That compilation is my favorite Smashing Pumpkins release by far because it has all those great you know songs from the, like, I Am One was a 10-inch, I think. Um, and, uh, and, you know, Blue and all that stuff. Like, the, that period, the ramp up, coming out of Gish, and then Siamese Dream, that guy wrote and recorded some just fucking amazing shit. It's got so much more lasting power to me um, than a lot of the Nirvana stuff. Um, did I stick around for a door? God, no, no. I was done. Uh, apart from 1979, nothing after Siamese Dream. I mean, nothing. You know, Tonight, that song is so fucking cheesy. Like that whole melancholy multi-album excess was just like, God damn it. It's, it just confirmed exactly what I thought when I saw him. It was just like, this guy has no ceiling for how full of shit he's going to be. And when Melancholy came out, I was like, oh, good. It's a concept album. It's a fucking double album. 
he's going to have eight singles off it. Like, duh. It was so fucking obvious that guy was going to pull that shit. And I just thought it was so fucking lame. I mean, but the world is a vampire. Like, just that phrase. Everybody was just like, oh, God. And then it's going to be, he's going to shave his head, the star. You know, I mean, what the fuck? It was so cheesy. Um, but he had the licks. And you know what, to his credit, too? I have to say, as much as I couldn't stand where he went, he realized that, like, goth and corn and mall goth, he realized that was coming around. And he was way out in front of it without completely, until you get to uh, whatever, Machina, whatever the fuck that one is, where he's, like, dressed up like a Matrix fucking character or whatever. Like, he's a, he's a true vampire lord with a big overcoat. Um, it wasn't until that that he got, like, over with. But he balanced that, like... All those mall goth kids weren't threatened by his band not being, you know, masculine or whatever. And, and he made a fucking he made a fucking shit load. Fucking dude was so hooked. Um, so yeah, I did see them. Uh, what is this? Oh yeah, this is great. This is the jukebox version of Moments in Love by Art of Noise. <laughs> um I saw this for like 40, 45 cents or 50 cents or something. And I was like, I have to have this. That's so funny. But yeah, it's the original 85 um, jukebox version on Island of Moments in Love. E, 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 e. Oh yeah, I was talking about Tugboat Annie, right? Sonic Bubblegum. This is the song, Jackknife. Um, it was one of the, one of the, like all these indie bands, these 90s indie bands, they had one song. They would have like one song. Archers of Love had a few. Um, but yeah, talk about Annie had like one and then there were a couple lesser ones, but, um, this song jackknife it's on YouTube. You can go check it out. It's just like a cute little indie twee shoegazy thing. And we were all obsessed with this song. We used to, we wore this fucking seven inch out and then the album came out. We wore that out too. It was right time, right place. Right. It's like, it's not as commercial as Weezer, you know, but it's the same shit like MILF, that band I love from Rochester. Um, or Buffalo, excuse me. I love them, but it's it's Weezer with edge or Weezer that's not so sardonic or, you know what I mean? And this is like Weezer but twee, I guess. You know, you delude yourself of all kinds of shit. But that was a band that was like, got to be a lot of college kids' bands for like a year, like sophomore year. We had them come play at Skidmore. I was the music director, so I paid for them to come play. And uh, Tweezer, sure, that works. Um, and they were actually okay live. Um, the singer really did think he was like a big deal, which was really weird. I was like, Dude, you're like playing Falstaffs at Skidmore, like to fucking 60 kids. What is uh, Wandering Lucy, original K single. Thrillville's on this one. Um, yeah, it's just this was the, you know, international pop underground period. And, um, yeah, Thrillville is a great fucking song. Just like a simple little two-note guitar thing over and over and over. Oh, this is a weird... I love this song. I, I put this... I I push this song on everybody, and I have forever, which is uh, Oshkosh Wonderboy, the B-side of this flowchart single. This was some guy, Sean... I forget his name. I think he was in Chicago or Champaign or whatever, or, or Urbana. Um, this guy, Sean O'Neill. Yeah. He was like this indie land of the loopsy loop guy in 96, 97. And there was another band he worked with called Tomorrowland. I think I had this crazy record they did. That's in it. The whole sleeve is plastic, like vinyl, like plastic, like 70s style heated and sealed together with it fully screen printed with this like sci-fi scene on the cover. It's so fucking sick. I'll pull that tomorrow or the next time I do it. But anyway, this this loop collage piece, Oshkosh Wonder Boys, it's so good. I think it's on YouTube. Um, but it's just really immersive and it has like this all the perfect boards of Canada, you know, uh, nature movie shit, but funny, cute samples, not without being totally pretentious. Um, I know I loved getting sent weed from Yigal at Interscope. He sent me uh, porn movies, weed, um, uh, money. He sent me money to chart Primus for six weeks. 
when uh, Sailing the Seas of Cheese came out, which nobody gave a fuck about. But he literally sent me 60 bucks. <laughs> what the fuck? That's how it used to be, boys. Um, he used to send me weed pretty much every other month. He'd send me like an eighth. And I just charted all the uh, Interscope shit. Because who gives a shit? Nobody even fucking listened to a radio station. You understand, the, the radio station I was working at, because Skidmore was a relatively big-ish liberal arts school, for some reason, CMJ never changed their rating. So CMJ, College of Music Journal, had a, a ranking system. And like the, the, the big station in Athens, what the fuck is it called? I forget the, the mega, mega it's like, you know, like K rock level, big college radio. So we're like B BRU and Brown in Boston. Um, not taped to the back. No, just like in the package. Just, it's just, it was just a package with weed in it. There was nothing else in it. Like it wasn't hidden in a CD case. It was a fucking literal quarter bag of weed. Um, the, anyway, the big stations were like a, they, they would be a five. That was the top ranking. And then like the fours, there were a lot of fours, but the threes, you know, if you get a bunch of threes together in aggregate, you get yourself five. And that's that was their game. They'd go to these stations that like no one listened to and no one gave a shit about. And that, you know, there was no like you didn't have a thriving, like, like if you think about ZBC in Boston, there's there's like people intensely debating whether REM is too commercial to play on our college radio station. We have to save this airtime for local bands. This is in, this is wrong. We can't play Sonic Youth. They're too big. They don't need our help anymore. I mean, you, I've been through ZBC and looked in the stacks and it's someone should make a book because all the albums have like that you can't see the cover for all the writing from people fighting with each other over whether or not it was good or whether or not it should be played. Like I saw a Bad Moon Rising, the ZBC copy, and it, it's just like these guys have totally sold out. This was their last good album. This is someone writing this in like 1986 after Evol came out. And the, like re the copy they have like the original ZBC copy of like like Life's Rich Pageant, and it's people fighting saying the REM have sold out and no one should play them, and like that happened at any like big real college radio station all throughout the 80s and, and even 90s, but where I was, it's like 10 people playing music to like 150 other people, but we were rated a three, so all the college radio promo people were like on our shit to get our chart to gig and jack the ratings. Yeah, no, seriously, it's fucking hilarious. I, there was also, um, what was the other record I looked at where they were just like, these guys totally sold out, fuck them, don't play them anymore. And it was like a relatively obscure band. Like, and I also pulled a Swirlies record because, um, and it was just like bullshit. It was like bullshit, college bullshit rich kid assholes don't play this bullshit you know play uh <laughs> fucking bim skull of bim i don't know what the fuck it was so bad suck patch i have all the suck patch seven inches again i really liked slabco i loved slabco i thought they had a great aesthetic in like a silly fun way and they did good loop music and stuff one of you guys might have sent me this team love new paul's new york what is this did one of you guys send me this I don't even know what this is. I don't remember. Lemonheads balancing act. So this is awesome. He, um, he, this Atlantic put this out. I don't know why. And Evan Dando covered the volcano sun's balancing act, which is one of my favorite songs ever. Um, and, uh, he did a really good job and, uh, he was one of his favorite songs. Clearly, you know, that's why he did it. But, um, I don't think it's been really. He also covers Galveston as the B side, which is pretty cute. Um, and I don't, I don't know if this ever got put out digitally. No doubt, it's on YouTube. But his version of Balancing Act is so good, and the original. I mean, go listen to Volcano Sun's Balancing Act first, so you hear that first, and you're not like going backwards from this more produced Evan Dando cover. But there it is, the only record that I own by the band Tortoise. I actually like this song. I actually like the song Reservoir, and um, I do own this one tortoise record, Thrill Jockey number six. It's the only tortoise I own, because I fucking hate that band so much. But yeah, this is the number six Thrill Jockey with the original logo, the original like stupid, like drew it on a fucking notebook or whatever. Um, low piano magic split, not very good. Sleep at the bottom is good though. 
the low song, uh, the piano magic song. It's not doesn't do anything. But yeah, that's sleep at the bottom and piano magic. I don't know what the fuck this even is. Random Boston bullshit. Jenny Toomey's band Licorice. Simple Machines, man, 94. Recorded by Warren DeFever. Why did I have it? That's why. I mean, Jenny Toomey was huge. She was almost nationally famous. Simple, Simple Machines was so fucking cool. Was that text printed in Comic Sans? I don't fucking know, probably. Singles come from 95. You're talking about, wait, oh, Torda? Yeah, you're right, actually. That, that thing they put out in Japan that was like a complete fucking ripoff. Um, the green, the green record they put out in Japan. Um, yeah, that has all their best stuff on it. No doubt. Fuck you. I don't know the tortoise worship wall. Why do I hate tortoise? I hate tortoise because they're full of shit. Um, they were just art wank bullshit. You know, I hated all of the nautical bands, uh, June of 44, everything coming out of Chicago at that time was so fucking annoying and and new york too um there was just this really awful period of noodly bullshit bands that were telling everyone how much they liked aim and duel and can and like faust and like that was supposed to excuse the fact that they suck fuck off like shipping news was just so precious and then like shipping news was basically like the innocence mission they were so fucking melodramatic and full of shit and like you know, walking around an old walled garden with a precious, you know, little girl pouring water in the center of the fucking fountain and spinning in a fucking Fleetwood Mac dress, you know, like they, it just all of that shit, man. It was so pretentious and, and just heavy with the pretense and heavy with the fucking packaging and the seriousness. And you go to the show and nobody even fucking talks and they just stand there and the band's just like, Ooh. it's like the drummer's heads down the whole fucking show. And I don't know. I don't know what it was. There were so many of these fucking bands. There were so many bands doing this. Wilco ended up becoming the epicenter of that whole scene. What scene? Wilco was, you got, I don't know if you guys realize Wilco was a total false start when that first record came out like summer teeth or I don't even know if that was the first one when that came out in 95, it fucking died. Wilco was like totally ignored. Sun Volt did way better than them. The other guy's band, J, uh, J Farrar. Sun Volt's album came out at the same time as the first world Wilco album and crushed it. Fucking erased it. When, when, when that fucking album came out when I was at Pitchfork and everyone was talking about Wilco, I was like, the fucking the guy with the mainstream voice from Uncle Tupelo has another record out. And everybody's like, it's Pet Sounds. It's the best fucking thing ever. Yankee Hotel Fox Trot. And I was just like, this is the most boring, fucking innocuous bullshit I've ever heard in my life. You gotta be fucking kidding me, guys. I, I don't know. Whatever. So this is the first single by uh the guy from Ratatat, Evan. This is Eric. Eric and I, he was in the Mysterians. We went to college together. And this is his younger brother who also went to Skidmore with us. And then he forms Ratatat out of, well, after he left school and moved down to New York. And they did the, like, the rap mixtape and stuff. And they just did huge, huge um, shit. But, yeah, it was awesome. Did, like, a cream, cream-colored single. Um, it, it wasn't, like, I don't think musically it was really strong. But, weirdly... The album he put out after this, Parking Lot Music, did super fucking well. Like it, it like got played on a lot of college radio stations, and um, the the first couple or two songs on it were, were really cool. Like he actually it was it was the clicks and cuts period, so he's like playing drums on a Mead notebook and shit like that. You know what I mean? Um, but his first album, Parking Lot Music, was fucking great, and then. I don't know if he did another one or whatever, lost touch. And then I moved down to New York and I'm down there and it's like, dude, have you heard about Evan? I was like, why? What, what do you mean? He's like, dude, he's playing with the guy from dashboard confessional and they're doing like new wave, like, uh, sh like weird fucking synth shit. You got to check it out. It's huge. I was like, Evan, what? And then the mixtape came out where they remixed whatever it was. I don't know. It was Missy Elliott or Wu Tang. They, they did this totally underground thing and it like blew the fuck up all these hipster shit bags 
you know, because this is the lull, right? The Strokes is sort of ending. The second album is like not that doing it. And Interpol's gassed after Evil. So like 2003, that whole thing is burning itself out. And then there was like the hype beast shit coming in. Like 03, 04 is when I remember Supreme totally fucking exploding. It was like that fucking skate wear, like trend shit. And then it started to become like the big shit, like big, everyone's going to start a fashion house. Everyone's going to start a fucking clothing label. Everyone's going to fucking, I mean, the speed at which New York like reconstituted itself, I guess I would say after 9-11 was super fucking kind of cool in a way. And I didn't like a lot of the bands and I didn't like James Murphy and I didn't like LCD sound system. Um, but there's no doubt there was a fucking happening fucking scene in, you know, especially Alphabet City, which is where we used to practice. Yeah, more music had him on there. Yeah, big time. Yeah, he had a, I mean, that he's on that comp. He was on a bunch of those comps. Those more music comps were also at the same exact time we're talking about O2 and all that. IDM, minimal, minimal, minimal electronica, like the chill out music. You think about the idea of chill out back in the rave days. That chill out music shit was huge in, in New York and, and in lots of other cities too. But the whole vibe in New York, like O2, one ish yeah, 9-11 was weird or whatever. But like 9-11 made it so that the Strokes and Interpol kind of stayed on the ground in New York a little bit. And the internet helped. And, you know, the fact that all the media publications and stuff were doing the biggest numbers ever. And late night TV was loosening up a bit. A lot of these bands were getting opportunities, blah, blah, blah. It was a really cool fucking time. I just wasn't into it. Like, I didn't, I thought these people were really fucking annoying. And they just were all hoovering coke all the time. And I'm not a coke guy. I don't like cocaine. I've never liked it. Um, that makes sense. Um, that Evan has a songwriting credit on Jesus is King. He's been, I mean, he's big. He, they played festivals for like six years off of like, you know, a couple of big songs. They've been playing festivals forever, making thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, I don't know if cocaine's evil. Some people love it. I just, it doesn't work. I, I can't, I've never touched it. Um, everyone I've known my whole life, friends, family, whatever, they're just like, don't ever do Coke. You're already on Coke. Like, just don't do it. And so I just never did. I don't know. It's like one of the only drugs I stayed away from. I just never had any interest. Oh, man, this is one of the best fucking hardcore. This, I mean, I'm not trying to be like, this is the real shit, you know, and obscure about it. But this 7-inch to me, I, I don't know. 1990, I was like 15. Boston hardcore was so meathead and basic and gangrene and like, you know, jokey bullshit. This is like, like grindcore and shit, as far as I know, didn't exist. Um, getting this like goth, this looks like the cure's faith. You know what I mean? Getting this kind of imagery for a cure fan, you know, and then hearing it and it's like fucking pure awesome Brooklyn hardcore. These guys lived on Carroll Street. Um, oh, I just, this thing is perfect. It's just perfect. It's six songs and uh, it's just got all the right notes for me. I, it was just so great. And it was because it didn't have any scene bullshit. It didn't have, this is, you know, Boston, not LA, New York, XXX, all that shit. The scene beef shit that was so boring. There's none of that, and I love that about them. They didn't play a ton. They didn't blow up, but there's a CD that is out there. Probably get on Discogs. I think they put it out. Someone in Germany, I think, put it out, and it's all their shit on one CD. Um, there's also a Christ on Parade. The band, the Gilman Street Band, has one too. I bought that. I'd never even knew about it, but when I got the Citizens Arrest CD off Discogs last year, when I just out of nowhere remembered that seven inch. Um, I I went on Discogs and they had that, and then there's a there's a Christ on Parade comp that's I think really expensive on Discogs now that came out. Um, what was post Ted Leo? Post Ted Leo? I don't know what you mean. Uh, Coke came back with a vengeance. Uh, Coke. Coke comes and goes. So yeah, I have all three colors of the Grudge single. So Grudge was a joke band that came out um, of the whole um, scene in on the West Coast. Uh, Nemesis put this out, but 
but created a fake label called Jism because he thought he was gonna, um, you know, like <laughs> he thought he was gonna get in trouble for like making fun of Straight Edge because everything out there was so fucking ridiculously uptight, and um, it just uh, it's so funny and, and it, it resonated with so few people, but like my friends were like annoyed with me about how often I would like joke around and play this record. Cause it's just like funny fucking, you know, punk joke songs making fun of, you know, whatever. There's a nemesis records book. The guy, the guy from, uh, what the fuck is the band? Um, Jesus Christ. My brain is fucking wiped from this COVID bullshit. Uh, what, what's the fucking band? The bit, the big nemesis band, Yo, fat ass, you got a big butt. Burpo. Uh, Civil Disobedience, also fucking awesome. The Minneapolis, man, they were so fucking good. Oh, man. I just loved all the fucking, like, I just loved all the stupid shit that, like, stayed early 80s and hash and, like, fucking, you know, it was, like, death. Is everybody okay? Oh, my kids just wiped out. I got to shut this down. It's almost 8 o'clock. She's going to fucking kill me. Um, yeah, I just, I fucking love all that shit. Um, yeah, there's the instruction manual for Intellivision NHL hockey. Randomly. It's in there. I don't know what that's about. I stopped panicking a few days ago. Uh, uh, Sea Hunt, knock on any door, beat happening with the actual cut, the actual, like, uh, die cut dots. This is a great one. I was huge into Twee and Hardcore, like, simultaneously. It was super funny in that way. Um, at that time, I don't know. Oh, Venus. Yeah. The low single Venus. This has embossed. It's totally been crushed from being in the, in the thing, but boyfriends and girlfriends is on this. The song's fucking awesome. Venus is also really good. That was a great period. I, I love low when low was on Vernon yard. They were like one of the best bands out there. I fucking love that second album, um, with violence on it. Violence is one of my favorite fucking songs. Um, and then they just went to sub pop with, uh, Songs for a Dead Pilot, the one on Cranky, was so fucking good. But then as soon as they went over, um, Curtain Hits the Cast was their last good record for me, and Songs for a Dead Pilot. And then it was like Dinosaur Act. I was like, what is this fucking corny bullshit? Ugh, not for me. Uh, what else do I have? I Am a Scientist, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's like, you know, they pressed a million of those. Um FYP, God, again, I love dumb, funny, fuck you, punk bullshit. This is the uh, FYP Propagandi split seven inch. Recess Records had some good sh shit. The Lot Six, oh my God. So the Lot Six was like this trying, winning Boston band around the time of the Strokes. The singer was like, I think I'm thinking of the right band. The singer was like six foot seven. And, uh, I think this is the band I'm thinking of. And they had this awesome song called I'm into it. That was like a, that whole garage rock thing when like gorillas, not, not the band gorillas, the Damon Albarn band. There was a band called the gorillas. That was like a garage rock, um, nuggets retro band, like that whole explosion. And it was before the white stripes, but like the, the very late nineties, um, there were shitloads of these bands, doing like Stooges style rave up shit. And then white stripes and the strokes just fucking erased all of it. There were like 15, 20 bands all trying to do that and stage this whole thing. Um, and uh, yeah, that, I think it was the lot six. They were really doing good in Boston. There were a couple of like could, could have been in Boston that um, had a good live, had good live shit together and just couldn't do it over. Couldn't get it over. Um, all right. I just got a couple more. I got to fucking sign off of this shit. Oh yeah. Classic rock is for pussies by the archers of loaf. So there was this label called Esther records in New York. I don't, they were on Lafayette. I don't know who did it or what it was from, but this actually was a couple of good little songs, smoking pot in the hot city and mutes in the steeple. Um, this was cool because a lot of people felt that VV was totally overproduced and sucked. And, um, so they did this trashier single after that, not to suggest it was a backlash per se, but a lot of people did feel that coming off of icky metal, that VV was just way too slick and kind of a little bit loping and 
maybe pretentious with like Step Into the Light, the first song. But like Harnessed in Slums to me is of all the twang, Paul Vo, Chapel Hill, you know, guitar, we know, we know shit. Harnessed in Slums, probably my favorite of all of it. That song absolutely fucking crushes, man. Um, I look like I'm going to replace some NASCAR wheels. Dude, what's up? It's the Wallies, man. Wallabies. What's up, dude? Don't you know fucking Australian rules football? Nah, fucking nah, 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 nah. I'm Aussie's fucking dirty guy. <laughs> Breadwinner. Yeah, it's here somewhere. Oh, God. The Propagandi double seven inch. And that was another one. Recess Records number 14. This has so many fucking inserts in it. It's like a book. It's so dumb. Um, anyway. What else do I have? Uh, that's bullshit. Don't know what that is. This was a fucking weird one, man. Alias? So that... that th I forgot about this. So Esther put this out in New York, and then Alias put it out. The same single. The same fucking songs. And I don't know why this happened. I don't know if they did this without talking to Alias. And it was like a contract thing. And they were like, what the fuck are you doing? I, like, I don't know why this exists in two formats. Like, I, I know why I have it. Because this was like our favorite fucking band in like 94, 95. Really 93, 94, and 95. Like, Archers of Loath was my college band. Like, their first album comes out when I'm a freshman. Their major label album comes out when I'm a senior. You know what I mean? Like, Stereo Lab, same sort of thing. I heard Stereo Lab as a senior. Yeah, my senior year of high school, I got switched on. That record had a huge promotion behind it. Like, there was nothing obscure about Stereo Lab from the start. Spin, all these magazines, they were like, fucking A, I've been waiting for some band this fucking cool for a long time. So switched on was super fucking promoted everywhere. Um, so if you were like a music obsessed kid or whatever, you totally got that shit. Um, Pang was way harder to too pure did not have good distribution out of the gate it was hard to get their shit um but yeah all right last one last two most people don't know about this one gem records pvc that american thing i was telling you about where like boys don't cry and all those fucking corny uh american issues of just like catch-alls of english bands this uh, is a Brix era double A12. I don't know what the fuck that they just couldn't get, a, get anything going in America. So they put this out on PVC and uh, they all, even this is 86. It still has the same label, the same template they were using in 80 when they did the Times Square soundtrack and the Cures Boys Don't Cry. They all have that same label for fucking seven years. Passport Records, the story behind this company, go look up Passport Records. Like the guy who ran it was running guns or some shit. Like it's absolutely fucking crazy, but it's funny as shit. But yeah, this is, um, this was a lot of people's, um, this and the, uh, there was a comp. What the fuck was it called? But they put out two different things and that was how they tried to launch the fall. Nice Glenn Gould chair. Uh, special low price, virgin import, original pressing. You need this record. If you don't have this, Paris Print Temp. Woof. God damn, man. The version of... Uh, what the fuck is it? Um, oh, that's the other thing about this. I have this... Uh, oh, I put the ear record in here. This is, this is the actual record that you're seeing behind me. The, the invaluable cover that I just fucking duct taped to the wall. This is the actual record. Um, but yeah, man, the, this is, oh man, I love this fucking record. It's so good. Um, Paris Opera Temps pill is just. Is it careering that's so good on this? The one where he like hates Malcolm. Low life. Low life. And I think careering is the other standout, but theme is good. You know, the public image theme is good too. Um, yeah, this is the original sticker, the original uh, special low price sticker from Virgin 1980, Paris on Print Temps. Um, 
totally all put uh, you know, by pill. And uh, I thought this was a great thing for them to do uh, to rush out a live record. You know, uh, in between, I think this is in between the debut and Metal Box. They rushed it out. It's completely, it's like the Cure's concert from 84. It's totally fucking raw. Like the Cure's concert was, he expressly made that record because he was so mortified by how precious Susie and the Banshees were around Nocturne, that double live album. They spent like an entire day, an entire day in the studio cutting and pasting a fan screaming for them to play Love and Avoid in between like four different songs so that it would have like a narrative build up to when they finally did play Love and Avoid at the end. And Robert Smith was sitting there like, I, I, I literally want to die right now. This is so painful. So he went out and mapped out concert, which they just bashed out in two shows at the uh, either the Odeon or the Apollo. I can't remember. There's YouTube clips when they filmed them too. But uh, yeah, man, fucking concert was so good because they just didn't fuck around. They got a good drum sound and then they just figured the rest of the shit out. A lot of it's direct. It's, I mean, there was probably some massaging somewhat during the mixing of it, but like that's just bashed out two shows, cobble it together, set, and then put it on a tape with all your B-sides as curiosity. And that was a fucking genius move, I thought, because, and I still think, because, uh, you know, R Robert Smith's entire career in the 80s, he was fighting the fact that he was on a major label and he had this hugely connected manager who was just constantly pressuring him to write hits and he'd done Let's Go to Bed and he just, he had fun with it or whatever, but it, he just didn't feel like grounded. He didn't, he hadn't done it. He didn't get it right. Like he he got the childhood despawn thing right in the trilogy, he did that. But like until head on the door, he's not like a man. He is like twenty five, twenty six. Head on the door. He's not like he doesn't have his thing down. He doesn't have his singing voice down. He's all over the place in those early records and the top and all that. He doesn't like become Robert Smith until really head on the door. Before that, he's just like another fucking big hair English wahoo dude, you know. I mean, he, he's more often mistaken to with mistaken for and compared with Boy George, you know, up until Head on the Door, and then Head on the Door, it was just like the music was so vital and different, you know, in a different way, obviously, the Culture Club. But all right, does anyone want to ask me anything? I got to shut this down. What do you got? What to use the most pure raw live non fixed in the studio? <laughs> I'm hoping you think of Paris by Pill. Um, what do you mean, the one I just showed? Uh, did Epstein kill himself? Um, most live, raw, non-fit. I'd say Nation Ulysses, but it's not live. Um, the beginning of uh, the first record. I'm not talking about some Beatles song written 100 years before I was born. God, I fucking... That song is one of the most pure, perfect things ever. The first song on the first Nation Ulysses record. Um... Isn't NAC, I don't know what you're talking about, dude. Is Duran Duran worth listening to past wedding album? I don't think the wedding album's worth listening to, so I wouldn't know. Uh, I, I drop out a big thing. I'm, I'm not, I, did, I didn't come undone and all that stuff. I wasn't into any of that, so I don't know. I mean, they were it was the best-selling album of their career by a mile. I mean, 97 or 98 or whatever it was when the wedding album came out and those, uh, what's his name? John Cucurillo, the guy who, Sold a fucking molded dildo of his own dick. <sighs> what an asshole. Um, he wrote those songs, you know, basically. He wrote the ballads that made them blow up on the wedding album. There was a huge source of controversy about that, and they, they had a big falling out. But that record, man, I think that was my senior year of college, 97, that record came out. Fucking everybody on that record. That, I mean, it was like you watched Friends and you listened to the wedding album. Warren Cucurillo, thanks. Um, yeah, you watch Friends and Seinfeld and you listen to the wedding album. And like there, I can think of probably a couple of other albums. But like if you were a mainstream person, that's what you did with your life. Watch Friends, watch Seinfeld, listen to the wedding album, listen to fucking Hootie and the Blowfish, listen to you know, I don't know, you know, I mean it was just that was the world that we were like, I don't want anything to do with that. Um yeah, weird time. I think of when the last Hootie and the Blowfish single from the first record came out. Was it Time? It's like a live video. Um, 
be here now. God, they shouldn't have even released that in America. Nobody gave a shit. I think it was time. And it's like him on stage playing. Oh my God. It's just, you just couldn't believe how lame music had gotten. It was so bad. And yet, like yet green day was happening at the same time. And you were hearing, seeing Longview on MTV every other minute, but you had this, it was like when VH1 was around. I don't know. It's hard to describe all these disconnects. But like, yeah, that meatloaf, bat out of hell two thing. You couldn't believe this was happening. It was like, what the fuck? Like, this dude's like sixty, and this is so fucking corny. Like, you, that that alienation from mainstream culture, which is so important to underground scenes, kind of firing. It doesn't exist anymore. And I wrote, I I I posted the in the cord that that Village Voice article I wrote about Peter Pan syndrome and about how the internet was making aging a, a false choice. There's no social cues telling you you can't, at 44, listen to fucking be a ba dee boo boo or whatever that, that young girl in England is doing the pavement song. There's no social cues walling you out and making you old because the, the content machine, the internet, all this shit, like... It's, it's just created a continuity. I mean, a lot of people will tell you this. People younger than me, they, they just don't feel like time is passing. It just doesn't seem like things are, there's no, the doors aren't closing. We're not getting gaps. The only thing that happened that feels like a gap, and I've talked about it a million times, and others have noticed, started to notice it too, is 2013, after Grimes came and blew up, everything after that's just been shit. Like we had this window from 20, 2009, chill wave, vapor wave into 2013. That like four year period was like by far the best period for music since I was a teenager, since 87 to 92. And um, yeah, I'm not a fan of Mark Fisher. I don't know. But um, I just, I, I look at, uh, I look at what's happened and all of the, all the channels have just been so commoditized. I mean, it's such a shitty, vague, corny ass thing to say commodification, commoditizing, but um, it just, it's really clear that there, you can't really, you have to try so hard to be obscure that the obscurity is meaningless and it, it devalues what was once a natural kind of tiering that was selective and elective and like not, like, yeah, you'd call people sellouts and mainstream music was lame and you don't know about cool stuff or whatever if you wanted, but not everybody did. Some people just naturally, you know, gravitated to these these different strata of of attention and music and their own participation was an important part of it too, right? I mean, you have to go find the records, you have to go buy the records, or you want to put them out yourself. Maybe you're that person. There's a bunch of those people. Start their own label. Um yeah, and I just after Odd Future just got absorbed and washed and became Golf Wang and all that fucking crap and Hype Beast and and Grimes suddenly was like you know Rock Nation signed her. She had like she had like three million dollars. Um, it just I don't know. I, I, we haven't recovered from that and and all these you know Snail Mail and Claro and uh, you know Alex G and. Um, you know, I still, I honestly still think Will Krause is going to be the fucking savior of everything. I've heard what he's working on. Um, I'd love to put it out. You know, I'd love to work with the guy, but I'm just too old. It's a generational disconnect. I'm like an old uncle, you know, when we talk. But I, you know, I've given little leak peeks of some of the stuff he's doing to the people on the court. And uh, he's just, uh, I fucking, I think he's one of the only people that's thinking hard that's like investing real like deep long view kind of vision of what he's doing with his music what he did last time how he can move it around all of a sudden like you know we talked before we one of the things i said to him he laughed his ass off when i first um because i you know he got signed because i tweeted about him right that's a fact fine it doesn't make me cool but at that time, I was, you know, at my biggest popular footprint, and I tweeted about it. I was just like, "This guy's doing it right. This guy's on the right path." And then he got signed, but the label that signed him was like, "Whatever." They weren't doing anything for him. Then he did that second record, and it was like Minute Men shoegaze songs, like one and a half, two, ten, two minute, ten second shoegaze songs, which is brilliant because you want to hear it again immediately. 
versus the tradition of five minute shoegaze songs, which are repeating the same verse and chorus for five fucking minutes. The, the point, is, like just taking that and saying, well, what if I just do it once and it's on you if you want to hear it again? That's what he fucking did. And he didn't even, it wasn't intentional, I don't think. But now he's, he's I think this next thing he's going to do uh, is much more deliberate. He's been playing shows, by the way, in Los Angeles. And uh, he, I really honestly think he's maybe on the cusp of like a Smashing Pumpkins style, like people really losing their shit for what this guy's doing. I don't know. But I don't, I doubt I'm going to end up putting it out or working with him too much because it, it shouldn't take much for somebody else who, who spends their life putting out records and promoting records to get this guy on their fucking calendar because he's just, it's so fucking good. The stuff, the stuff he, I mean, there, there's four or five songs on the last one, the yellow and purple cover that are like bomb is huge. Um, they're all great. Um, but the, the new one is just like, there's growth stylistically, there's evolution, there's, you know, more of what you love. He gets that. Like, it, there's no shame in that. He's got to have a couple that you, you can't move too quick, right? People who like you can't move too quick. And, and also, like, what if they find out about you from this record and they go back to the last one? So, I mean, he's, he's very 360 in his thinking in a way that's not cynical. I love that. I hear that about the GBV thing. I can hear that. That's definitely true. Um, they were, they were similarly like, you know, getting it on, getting it over with. I talked about, you know, the last one I talked about shocker and gloom town and that's just like, you know, you bash it out, you get it done. It's like the who, well, like when the who started, you know, it's like two, two and a half minutes, get it over with box tops. Oh God. I just made like an almost famous reference, Oh fuck! but it is true. The letter, I don't even think the letter is two minutes, isn't it? 158. Do it. Do it. Do it. What am I doing? Am I, are we making uh, Shia LaBeouf jokes? I don't get it. Was I on Tiger Beat 6 shit? The only Tiger Beat 6 record I think I have is the Dean Wareham. Was that Tiger Beat? The Dean Wareham thing he did with his wife when they were divorcing and he tried to save his marriage by doing a record with her. So bad. Um, his book is pretty good, by the way. Dean Wareham's memoirs, Black Postcards. It's really good. It's a good read. Letters 152. There you go. You really got me. He's 126. Uh. That's an impression of Ozzy in Decline 2. What sounds awful? Lol, holy shit. We're, we're going out with a bang. The Dean record with his wife, yeah, it's really fucking bad. You can Google it. Uh, he, he almost completely cops to what that exercise was in the book. Um, and, uh, yeah. Oh, it's brutal. I mean, it's so fucking painful. If you've read, like I have the galaxy 500 book too, which, uh, was by the guy who did the, my bloody Valentine 33 and a third. He was like a, he was like a obsessed with galaxy 500 as a kid. And he had like, he knows their whole history. And, um, he did a book about them and, um, all the interviews with Dean, uh, sorry, with Damon and Naomi, they're so they're just so unyieldingly, unendingly bitter. And Dean Wareham's just like, eh, it was a band I was in. <laughs> like he just doesn't give a shit at all. Like, dude, the guy grew up in like New Zealand and like moved to New York. His brother was a drug addict. Like, he has nothing in common with these Harvard, you know, like they they were totally set up, um, you know children of pretty well-to-do families um and dean was just like you know this uh kind of transient moving around thing crystallized movement band i don't know what that is dean was a massive horn dog yeah the book is very shocking because i you know i know people who think of him as like this holy dylan poet figure who like you know is is it's beautiful uh, tortured 
man that they the only they can understand him. I mean, I, a couple of my my best girlfriends in college were like that, and they still are. One of them just went to see him in Rhode Island playing Bewitched, um, and she sent me a picture of her with Dean, and I'm just like. Have you read Black Postcards? Because he would have been down. I mean, he was terrible with it. Terrible. He has, he has a story in Black Postcards about him shagging a prostitute. It's fucking crazy, man. No, he was a madman. Did fuck loads of drugs, too. When they were in England and Europe, they were fuck, he was fucking a total fucking coke hole for a while. Yeah, nothing at all that you think. That's why the book is so good, you know? Because he's marketed almost as like a twee figure in America. When like in England, they were like, it's the Velvet Underground. They've come back. Spaceman 3 wasn't the end of it. This is the new revolution of simplicity and, and truth and authenticity. Like It was like when the Pixies went over there. When Galaxy 500 went over there, they were just like, everyone thinks we're fucking Jesus Christ and we can't get arrested in America and I drive a fucking shitbox. You know, it's awesome. Good day. important questions i did text maura she's theoretically down but we just don't we we don't have the same like lives or, or lifestyles like we we've um i work for i work from home and do my shit and and she's much more involved in like still writing and and things like that and so it's she goes to shows and is, is like out in boston like it, it's very difficult to sync up but there's there's no way i'm doing that with anyone else like uh she she like knows the members of all of the bands and decline too by heart. I know the dialogue and I know some of the bands, but uh, yeah, no, she's uh, she's unbelievable um, on hair metal, like fucking intense. I mean, even the podcast is awesome. I th I mean, I personally, if you, if you if you're interested in decline too, like that podcast should fucking come with it. If you're like one of those people who wants to learn every line, like because she. She goes so deep, and we, I, I'm really like the audio is not great, but I've never heard anyone, you know, from our background with the breadth of music knowledge and everything that we have, like reify 87, 88 hair metal and what damn Yankees and Warrant and fucking what that shit was like when you were like a fucking young punk or goth listening to The Cure and like everyone else in your schools were in fucking stonewashed, full Canadian tuxedo, smoking Marlboro Reds. You know, like it, the, there were still people that you it could have been 81 for all anybody knew, except instead of like, you know, lover boy, it's Def Leppard. Um, man, I mean, that time was so fucked. It was, it was so crazy. Sean is just too busy with his own stuff. He's, I mean, Sean's a professional writer. Like he, he's got gigs. He's, I, I did, I have talked to him, you know, cause he did this roadhouse thing where he wrote about roadhouse every day for the entire year. Um, I, I, I don't know what he's going to do with that. I would like to publish it, but I, I should think that any publisher would want to, um, publish that. It's a very obvious, interesting, um, you know, topic and, and package. Um, but yeah, no, uh, I, I doubt that I'd be doing any more pods with Sean and unless somehow I turn the corner and I do the music supervisor, um, videos but i just don't i don't think it's going to hang together and again i think the copyright thing doesn't make it worth the effort i mean I, if i do a bunch of fucking live streams like this where i just talk shit to 40 fucking people or whatever and make a playlist like people can just watch that i don't know i'm i mean for i'm old enough that i can do this and not say anything that regrettable you know but like you know back when i think it, that would have been a problem as for bands in the UK, unrest, we all know what an unrest. I don't know. Yeah, the hair metal cast was great. Thank you. I really love it. Shauna's doing a podcast, by the way. Shauna, Shauna has her own podcast with a friend of hers. Um, but it's like anybody else. She did three episodes out of the gate and then just, it's like everybody. You know, you get the inspiration, you get psyched, you do it, a couple people talk to you about it, blah, blah. And then you're just like, oh my God, it was the inspiration. Quarantine is going okay. I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I, the last few days, I've been feeling some things that I'm, I'm concerned. Um, but uh, you, you're never going to know until you know. I'm either going to get it or I'm not. I don't know. Uh, the problem for me is not anything to do with my family or our quarantine. My, my parents are, you know, in an in, in older age bracket and uh, and they live next door. So um, that's all I'm thinking about. And my dad had to have surgery yesterday. So um, you hear the Boston accent coming there and yesterday? Um, he had to have surgery yesterday. And uh, so, yeah, uh, he had to go to the fucking hospital. And that I, that's not good. But I'll tell you this, Brigham and Women's is uh, not busy at all. There's, I don't think there's a lot of people, you know, um, 
that have hit the symptom phase, you know, around the Boston area, apart from the Biogen people that were in the news uh, with their conference had a big exposure because people came over from Europe. But um, yesterday, yeah. Uh, working from home sucks ass. No, I've been doing it for two years. It's fucking amazing. It's great. You get paid and you never leave your house. It's fucking awesome. Are you kidding me? I, I mean, I, I don't know what kind of work you do, but like working from home is the fucking shit. Never, ever fucking going back to commuting to a fucking job. Oh, oh thanks. Yeah, I mean, well, I'm, I'm sure we'll be fine. I don't know. Hopefully. I, I don't think there's any information that anybody can act on or think about. D uh, DKK, Daniel K. Kim has it now. Whatever is the, the guy from... Uh, the guy that was uh, the husband of son in Lost, he has it. He just did this huge Instagram post um, about it. And he was like, you know, right, righteously saying like this fucking Asian racism shit has to stop. I mean, my wife didn't want to go jogging by herself when this was blowing up. Like for real, because the Facebook rhetoric is like super fucking racist. Um, it sucks, man. It just sucks. It sucks that it sucks that everybody has a platform because not everybody should have a platform. You know, there used to be ways that shitheads couldn't get platforms. Now everybody can. Uh, that's not going, that's not getting undone. Donkey Kong has it. Yep. Funny. Imagine never having to commute again. That was the dream and we got it. We both work from home. It's fucking great. Panic is worse than the root. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. No doubt. But uh, it's going to be a long time. I, 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 again, like I, I'm completely... I, I, like I said at the beginning, I, this is going to be years of, of shit happening until they get a, a working vaccine. The bottom line is until they get a vaccine, <laughs> all we're doing is flattening the curve that they always talk about. That's all you can do. Until they have a vaccine, everyone's going to keep getting it. People are going to come back to China, come back to these places. They're already seeing in South Korea and China reinfections from people coming back from other places. Until you have a vaccine to immunize people, this thing is going to keep going. Um, it's fucked. Did I hear the new Fort that? Oh my God. God, I can't stand that guy. I did remix Angel Echoes though. It's on my SoundCloud. <sighs> Rip going to shows. Was it really, was it any good? Has it been good in a long time? I don't know. I saw Melody Valentine on the MBV tour and I turned my back to them during To Hear Knows When because it was so fucking bad. Show venues have gotten so sanitized. The mix is so fucking soft and lame it's just not even it's horrible it's like listening to a fucking cd all venues now you know with modern digital sound systems it just it sucks the mix is terrible it just sounds so sterile and clean and the speakers are you know hard limited to dbs and stuff it's like i miss going to shows where it was like scary like i mean i've said this before this anecdote the loudest band i ever saw live well i never saw mercury rev because they got kicked off La Palooza was the pale saints opening for ride the bass not the bass not the kick drum the bass was so loud that it was moving my rib cage which is you know anybody who's been at a show like that can appreciate that sensation um it uh it was like moving my rib cage and i felt like it was gonna change my heartbeat like i would die of a heart attack because it was like the pressure was so extreme that i felt like my heart wasn't beating right um and it was the pale saints, you know, like throwing back the apple. Um, and then ride was the, you know, the headlining band and, and they weren't like, it was awesome. Ride. The loudest thing in ride was laws was the drums. His, his ride symbol was so loud. It kind of fucked up the mix a little bit. You couldn't, you couldn't, um, hear, uh, you couldn't hear Andy's backing vocals, um, that well ride were really hit or miss live too. I mean, I did say in the shoegaze video, they were the best live act going. I'm spoiled. The times that I saw them, they were fucking on, like on hardcore. But I mean, there's a lot of people I've talked to who are just like, really? I, I heard you say that. I thought they kind of sucked and, you know, but whatever. In my experience, it also has to do with how caught up in ride I was. Like, yes, I loved My Bloody Valentine, but I'm a drummer. So taste, fucking polar bear, like, Laws was a Keith Moon style fucking drummer. And I learned to play drums mostly along to disintegration and nowhere and imitating them, Boris Williams and Laws. And I'd said before George uh, from the Minutemen, uh, I certainly didn't learn anything about drums playing along to fucking pavement or covering Zurich is stained with my high school duo. 
band. Um, I think all that shit's on the Dropbox. If you sign into the cord, you can get it. But all right, I'm going to shut it down. Um, we'll see if we can do it again. Peace.